Hello, my name is Don Dickerman uh, with Don Dickerman Ministries, uh, Liberated Living and Deliverance Ministry. And uh, some of you have seen our uh, videos, uh, some of you have seen our uh, website. Uh, but we have a, a special program today, a special video. Uh, I'm here with my friend Emily Mann uh, from Maine. I'm talking about Maine, way, way up from, did you say 2,700 miles? It was 27 hours. Oh, 27 yeah. hours. Driving, yeah. Well, that's worse. <laughs> <laughs> 27 hours they drove to, uh, to get here, and uh, Emily went through uh, deliverance yesterday, and we had a great time together. Uh, her husband, Eli, is uh, in the studio, and... Uh, appreciate Eli knowing him and their, their ministry. They attend uh, an Assemblies of God church in New Hampshire. They live in, <laughs> live in Maine, drive to New Hampshire for church, but it's only, what, 20 miles or something? Yeah. Just across the border. Uh, but Emily has one of the most amazing stories uh, I, I think of the 27 to 30 years of ministry I've been involved in, uh, she's a picture of God redeeming and recovering uh, a bruised, broken life. Emily was um, five years old when she met a uh, sex trafficker, not on purpose, but her best friend was also five years old, I guess. And she would spend the night with her best friend. And uh, I mean, little girl, five years old. But her best friend's father was a pedophile and a sex trafficker. Uh, well, she didn't know that. How would you know five years old? But she said he would come get in the bed with them at night and began to molest Emily and ask her, does that feel good, do you enjoy that, and so on. But eventually, tra trained her to please men with a pistol, you said it with a pistol in your mouth. That wasn't him, I mean he had... That was somebody else, yeah. but it was one of the... the that was a different um, person, but he did um, have guns and use them to intimidate and... And it was part of the intimidation was uh, if you tell your parents, we'll kill your cat or something. Yeah, it was um, a lot of like your... Um, if you tell, it has to be a secret because for one thing, um, he got me to, you know, admit that I liked it at five years old, um, and also that um, my mother wouldn't love me, uh, nobody would believe me, and um, that it would be really bad if I ever, if I ever said anything. Yeah. So they basically were coercing you to keep quiet. Mm -hmm. uh, now, five years old. Bless your heart. I mean, that's a, that's a little girl. Mm. So eventually, they would take you to a department store? Yeah, so that, the earliest um, memory that I have of being actually trafficked was going to the mall and meeting somebody that I didn't know in the food court and he took me into a large like bathroom that was a single stall that you could lock um, and there is where he put a gun in my mouth um, and you know really threatened me and he this person I didn't know knew my um, mom name my sister's names and the name of my cat actually cat, yeah yeah and so um, so your best friend's dad took you to the food court and handed you off to somebody else yes yeah well wow. and um, I mean I don't know how 
in depth you want me to go, but um, well, you just you just share what what you want to there. Okay. Um, yeah. So he in that first bathroom, um, you know, uh, threatened me and then abused me. Um, and then we went to the larger bathroom, you know, that had a bunch of stalls. Yeah. Uh, it's the food court at the mall. So, um, but in between leaving places, he would um, choke, basically choke me out, you know, so I would pass out. And then as I came to, we were like rushing out of the bathroom um, and then into the next bathroom where he, you know, um, abused me again and same thing, choked me. And then we went into the department store. Um, now, the choking, room. was that part of the sexual? I think it was to disorient me. Okay. And to just. Um, also, and to threaten you. Yeah. And um, just so that I would go do the next thing without. Yeah. Without putting up a fuss. Could be worse next time. Yeah. So, um, and so then we went to, he brought me into a dressing room, um, and he told me that I would know what to do and um, to sit there and wait for him to come back. And so before he came back, three or four um, men came at different times with a pair of pants and they put it down and then what I realized at the end of it is when he came in all those pants had money tucked in the pockets. This and this was like a regular department store. I think you told me Old Navy. Yeah. Yeah. And it was like a dressing room. Yep. He put you in there, told you you would know what to do. Mm-hmm. You, and you knew what he was and talking about. I am not sure I knew exactly what he was talking about. But when the first guy came in, I knew because uh, my friend's father had trained me into yeah. knowing what to do. So I didn't, I, I didn't know until that man got in the room, you know, then I knew, you know, what I was supposed to do. And it was three or four men that came in. And so when, when that was over, was your friend's father outside or we met him back in the food court which was just around the corner from you know in that mall um and yeah he was there in the food court and i think then we you know got like a piece of pizza or something and i was a good girl and um oh. you know rewarded you did a good job did a here's good a job here's a slice of here's pizza a piece of pizza <laughs> yeah well so what, I, I know I, we talked about this yesterday, but your mom didn't know about this, obviously. No. Uh, and, and you didn't feel free to tell her? Correct, yeah. Well, where was your dad at the time? My dad, at that time, he was um, still married to my mom, but he was a work, workaholic. Yeah. He was always gone um working and yeah he just wasn't like a big part of right. our lives so your did your did your friend uh katie did she know what was going on i don't know i don't ever remember her actually um being you know um tra like given to anybody else um so she didn't know. I don't think she was doing that to you. Yeah, I don't. I don't think so until maybe later when I wasn't around anymore. I I have a hard time believing that he didn't do things to her. Well, sure. Yeah. Sure. Where so where where was her mother at the time? Was she involved? I mean, involved in her life. So yeah. So her. Um, parents were actually married when I first started going over there for sleepovers at five um, and then and it was always he used to wake me up at night and bring me down like into the basement and that's where like the training and the grooming went on um, but then one night was different he you know, it was two bedrooms at the top of the stairs. It was um, the 
master bedroom and then Katie's bedroom and there was a bathroom in between and so he brought me in there and that night um, Katie's mom woke up and she came in and saw um, you know him and I together and I just remember she just was screaming and screaming sure. and um, and so then they went downstairs and uh, then the next morning it was like well we're just not going to talk about because I remember Katie asked the next morning like what happened in the middle of the night yeah. and um, she said we're not going to talk about it and then they got divorced um, but she never she never told my mom what she saw um, so did when they got divorced did Katie go with the father yeah, so there was a there was a period of time where he was like getting getting it together. He had to find an apartment and all this stuff. And then um I was over there again and um and actually it was interesting cuz my mom was there to pick me up and he showed up and uh he was like, "Do you want to go to the mall?" He was there to take Katie to the mall. And, um, and I didn't, I had not gone to the mall. Like we didn't do that. Um, so, and so Katie was an only child and I had sisters and she got to do a lot of stuff I didn't get to do. It was, it was just a different, um, you know, different life. And, um, so I wanted to go to the mall and I remember Katie's mom hesitating, like, like, you don't want to go with him because of what he's done. But I was so little, I just... I thought I want well, to go to the mall. Like yeah, I've sure. never been there and I've heard about You're it. You're five, six years old. Yeah, and um, so I went with them, you know, um, and that was that first experience at the Old Navy. Um, wow. And yeah. So you you told me that at some point, uh, I mean, this continued until what ten, eleven. Yeah, I think it's hard to say because I don't have like right. normal memories of things. But um, and my mother did ask me at multiple times throughout this period of years that it went on. Um, she did ask me like, "Has something happened to you? Has somebody done something to you?" And and I just was deny, deny, deny. Well, you were afraid to say. I was afraid that they would kill my mom or that she wouldn't love me, and. Um, and that was really powerful, um, and I just kept quiet. I thought I can handle this, and um, well, he also took you to other motels uh, and handed you off to yeah, yeah, somebody I, else to somebody else. I was um, dropped off at one um, motel in particular. I really remember, um, and. That place was like, it was just totally, a, it was like a different world. Um, the, we went into the lobby and the manager or the owner, I don't know, he would beat his wife in front of me um, and she sat on the couch with a lampshade over her head um, because, he, you know, he told her she was so ugly and, um, and it was just a really scary place. Um, because, you know, he left, he left me there. Um, and then the manager, I, the room that, that I went to was a, adjacent to the lobby and, um, and he, I, I got tied up in the bathroom there. There was like a, a bar in the shower yeah. and that's, he, I got tied up in there and then, um, that was to keep you from leaving? Yeah, because I, um, you know, originally he told me just to stay in there, and I had snuck out and tried to talk to, um, you know, that woman who had the lampshade over her head. Um, and, you know, that wasn't um, acceptable. So were, were men coming in to see you there? Yeah, um, I really don't, I, that, I really don't have... It's all it's all pretty blotted well, out in okay, my mind, but, but you were still a little girl. Yeah, what seven maybe? S yeah, seven, eight. Um, 
Again, I'm not sure I in the span of years, but it was it it went on and um, well. and it wasn't all the time though. It was like every every couple of weeks he would come and and bring us. You know, we would go for a sleepover at his house, and I'm not. Uh, I don't even think my mother knew that he was picking us up. I think she thought I was at Katie's mom's house, and he okay. would come and get us. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, she she wouldn't have. Yeah. Probably wouldn't wouldn't have. Well, uh, so <laughs> were you in school at the time? Yes. Did that affect? Yeah. Uh, how you? Viewed the world in school and everything. Yeah, I um. I, I managed to get through school just by being there. Um, I didn't. I didn't learn a lot, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but um, but I got through it, and um. And I just, I didn't have a lot of respect for authority or anybody well, telling sure. me what to do yeah. because I thought, you know, here's all these people who are trying to tell me what to do and they don't even know what really goes on. Yeah. And um, so I just, I just sort of did enough to get by, I guess. You know what, though, that still goes on. Uh, I mean, big time. And uh, a, a lot of ladies that may be watching they don't that they, they don't think that happens to other people. There are tons of people yeah. that we see in deliverance that have been abused from the time they were almost from the time they were born. But you also told me, Emily, that uh they took a like a family vacation, uh with Katie and her dad mm -hmm. to a theme park. And they invited you to go, and you're like, oh, yeah, mall, theme park, you know. Yeah. So, uh, was it like a Six Flags stop? I mean, I know that wasn't it, but was it? Yeah, it was that type of, it was a large theme park, and it was about 400 miles from from my house. It was a, So it was a trip. It was yeah. we went on a big trip. And, and you thought it was just going to be... I thought I was going to the theme park. I thought I was going to go and like ride the rides and do all the stuff and um wow. and that wasn't the case. Um, so when you got there, I think you told me you, they had some kind of little program and you sat through the program and it was dark and when you went outside your eyes were adjusting to the light and everything and somebody else was holding your hand. So he had handed you off yeah, to right. Somebody else. Right there in in broad daylight with everybody running around and you know, it was a very busy theme park and yeah, when I when we were outside I realized that it wasn't him uh holding my hand, it was somebody else and um They had they had had you a hotel room. Yeah. So you you, you didn't see the theme park. You saw a hotel room for what, several days? I think I was in the hotel room for about four days is my wow. estimate. Um, I, I know this is not easy for you to talk about, but you had uh, somebody was watching you in the, or watching over you in the hotel room as other guys would come in to have sex with you. Mm -hmm. Uh, did you think about running? Where would you go? No, yeah. Um, still, at that point, I think the outside world, like the unknown, was scarier than being with uh, these people. And also, they um, much of the time, they were putting something in my mouth, and I, uh, I really believe it was um, ketamine, which is like an animal tranquilizer. Um, and so I was very, you know, it just, if you take too much of it, it like paralyzes you. Um, I know because later in life, I ended up having all sorts of like drinking and drug problems. And that was one of my yeah. drugs of choice. 
Um, but so a little bit and you're just very like, you know, it's a tranquilizer. Yeah. It's just calms so everything down. So they just down. rub it on They just rub it in my mouth. Um, and uh, a lot of the times, like if there was no, if there was no one, you know, there to visit me, I was just like kind of passed out in the bathtub. They not there's uh -huh. no water in it, but they just like they just left me in there and um, keep me, you know, yeah. not like so they didn't have to deal with me or you know I don't well, know so. How, how many how many men would come in there like in a day's time? I don't, I really don't remember. Um, the I think because I was so drugged. Um, I, the things that really s stuck out were the, like, people who were particularly violent. Um, well, and, and you're, you're still, what, eight years old? I then? think I was about eight years old. Well, that, that's incredible. I, people, people are going to be praying for you because <laughs> you, you've already overcome, uh, I mean, you're, you're a beautiful lady. Your husband is not that good looking. <laughs> <laughs> He's listening. <laughs> but I mean, you, your your life is okay now. Yeah. To some extent. God is good. Uh, well, you told me about one incident where different people were coming in the room, and one guy put a pillowcase over your head mm -hmm. and slammed your head on the. Yeah, the, uh, off the counter, counter of the bathroom. Yeah, he put a, a pillowcase over my head, and then I, what I think was a belt, um, like around, you know, through my mouth, and, and he held it real tight, and then just smashed my face off of the counter a couple and, of times. And he was having sex with you. That was part of his. Yeah. Wow. Um, and you, you, you still had neck problems because of that. Yeah, yeah. But I I've think had, that's gone now. I think it is gone now. Yes. <laughs> but you know, uh, it's hard hard as that is to, you know, to even conceive. Uh, sex trafficking is all over the place. Oh yeah. And uh, people that have five, six year old kids. Uh, Parents, you just need to keep an eye on them. Uh, you don't, you don't think it could happen, but you didn't think it could happen. You would, you would have never thought that would be your life. I think you also told me that one guy came in the room that was like uh, high-ranking, like a police officer or something. Yeah. And he was, uh, he kind of took over. Yeah, so the, he that instance was the only time that the people who were collecting the money, the traffickers, that they actually ever left the room. Usually it was they stayed in the bedroom part and then I was in the bathroom and whoever paid to come in would, would visit me in the bathroom. Um, but this was different and I couldn't, uh, you know, my kid brain couldn't figure out why, but, um, but they left and he was extremely violent, um, with me. And I think that's, you know, also, but he, that was not the pillowcase guy. This yeah. is a separate, um, but yeah, he was, and so I really remember that, you know, there's, um, only so much that drugs can numb out before you're like you're yeah you, this is real it, yeah it really gets to you so well uh, so I I don't know who would have been in the room at that time but is this the same guy that got so rough with you that there was a fight no that was so that was the pillowcase um, guy. And what happened there is, um, you know, I just remember having my face being smashed into the counter, and then all of a sudden, 
he was gone from the bathroom and um, so I took the pillowcase off and I looked in the mirror which was um, was scary because there was you know blood all over my face and um, I just looked didn't look like me you know it just was I had black circles right. under my eyes and um, so then I looked out into the room and the two traffickers were were beating him they beat him with a, like a pistol in his face and I remember like teeth coming out and his it was just the grossest blood, blood. I mean it was just really bad um you and were eight years I old. was eight years old yeah wow. and so then after that it was like I didn't have any respect for any authority. I thought, you yeah. people have no idea what's going on. So right. I became a very well, difficult so child. So they actually killed the guy in front of you mm -hmm. at this theme park. And uh, in case anybody's watching that's interested, uh, you can call me and I'll, I'll tell you where the theme park was because I guess it's an unsolved murder. Yeah. Um, but you said you you've actually made police reports, but not in that. Not town. in that state. Yeah, I reported sort of my story to, um, you know, in, in Massachusetts and New Hampshire, but not. Um, Bless your else. heart. So, you come back to Maine, and uh, did you just continue back to school. It was I was living in Massachusetts, Massachusetts. then, yeah, yeah, and um, that after that trip was my first like depression. I had I felt really depressed. Um, I became like suicidal. Um, you know, I never attempted, but um, but it was always a the thought. Thoughts, were, the thoughts yeah. were always there, always there. And um, my mom asked me, she said, what happened to you? And um, and I just couldn't tell her because no. I was afraid, you know. Bless your heart. So did you still see this guy? Not. After that, I just stopped. I didn't go hang out with Katie anymore. Um, he did make an attempt, I remember, um, to sort of get me back. Um, he showed up at my mom's house one day on a motorcycle and he had a, like a plain white t-shirt, kids size though, and he's like, oh, I think Emily left this, you know, like trying to give himself a reason for stopping by and I'm like, that's not mine and it's not, you know, right. it's just not. Um, but he was like, do you want to go for a ride on the motorcycle? And that, like, kid part of me that didn't have excitement was like, yeah, I want to ride on a motorcycle. And um, so I did. I went, and he just, you know, we went around town and then came back to my mom's house. Um, he was just trying to, like, lure me back in to yeah. uh, hang out with Katie again because he needed, you know, he needed me to hang out with Katie in order to, right. to do that stuff. But it wasn't that I just, after that, I was just so really just depressed and not myself anymore. Well, so was was that the end of the sex trafficking? I think, yeah, I... But, but you were still like 10 years old. I, yeah. Um, and I did stay friends with Katie. Um, and I, I had gone... We did take a trip with, um, I think I was about like 15 when I went with her, but we went with a group of girls and her dad. Um, but I don't think, I don't think anything happened on that trip. Well, um, so he obviously was, was a pedophile. And, um, and for those of you that, that are listening, he had, he obviously had been sexually abused or stuff gone in, on in his ancestry to to be who he became. Uh, but we when we were uh, going through deliverance yesterday, I commanded some of the demons 
how long have you been in this family, in this ancestry? So I think one of them was 575 years. Yeah. Way before you were born, stuff was happening in your ancestry. And uh, so I'm commanding this demon, well, what gave you permission to this family? It was incest. You, you didn't give that permission, but somebody in your ancestry did. Same way with his life, something was passed to him that caused him to be the jerk that he turned out to be. Uh, but that's the same way with anybody in the world today. We get our blessings from our ancestry, mm -hmm. but we also uh, are subject to the curses of the ancestry. And uh, you, you, you had a great deliverance. Uh, your smile even yeah, says yeah. it. Uh, <laughs> but uh, what, what do you think about Eli? You think he's going to work out? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Eli's the best. I love Eli. God, uh, God was very good to me to send me Eli. I, I know that. <laughs> uh, I'm joking because Eli is just sitting right around the corner. <laughs> And uh, he's, he's got a, a monster truck, crushes cars and yeah, stuff like that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, he, he told me he crushed my car <laughs> <laughs> in the driveway. Uh, well, I, I like both of you. You, you. you obviously love the Lord, and uh, you, your testimony is, is going to affect a lot of people. Emily, to recap was sex trafficked from age five years old, basically, until age 10, 11. Uh, but what, what happened after that, Emily? Were you, was life normal? Did you go back to school and not have any problems? Or what, how, how did that work? Yeah, so I had a lot of problems. Um, I had no respect for authority. Um, I loved my mom and my family, but um, I knew that they didn't know really what, they did, certainly didn't know what I had seen and right. um, gone through. And uh, I think I think as early as 13, I started drinking. Um, by 15, I was seeking out alcohol every day. Um, and do, then, do you know why? But was it to? I at the time I didn't know. It really was. Um, it really. I just wanted to escape. No, because that's and, what and I mean. And be numb. Yeah. yeah. But I didn't like. I didn't know if you had asked me then. Like, why do you do this? I wouldn't have been able to give you the like, right. correct answer. Right. Um, so, yeah, and then I really just experimented with any drug that I could really get my hands on, um, you know, with the exception of heroin, um, because I had had an experience witnessing my um, uncle die of AIDS complications, uh, and my mother used that to be like, that's because of heroin use. So I was like, that was really, I mean, watch somebody die of AIDS complications yeah. is horrible. And so I just knew I was not going to try heroin, but anything else was fair game. And I did um, drugs and alcohol. Uh, 13, 14 years old. Yeah, really, it really started um, at 15, you know, because that's when I was able to really go out and find it. Um, I would have done it earlier, but there, right. it was like hard to get it. When I could get it, I, I would do whatever I could, you know, find. Um, but, but at 15, I was able to, you know, I had somebody who would buy me liquor. Um, you actually used to be able to call up the taxi cab companies and ask them to buy a bottle of liquor and bring it to your house. And they really? would, yeah. So I did that all the time. Um, and, uh, yeah, I really was, I mean, I didn't care if I died. Um, I remember praying, uh, because... You, you, excuse me, yeah. you, you were saved when all this started, right? Yeah, I accepted Jesus in my heart um, when I was, I think, about five. It was shortly before 
um, you know, that first sleepover at my friend's house. Wow. And um, so, so that was, uh, but I had, had no teaching about Jesus, um, and I had no, um, you know, no concept of what it, any of it meant. I knew you could pray. Um, right. I knew that God listened, um, and uh, I just, I, but I do remember, I think, at, at some point, praying to God, like, I just would rather die than be raped again. And, um, and, you know, he said, he said, no, <laughs> you know, that wasn't, well, that wasn't you, it. You actually started having suicidal thoughts. Uh, oh yeah. Shortly after that. Mm -hmm. And th that's, that's the work of demons. Mm -hmm. uh, and the demons came through the trauma and you were the victim, but you, you picked up demons through the trauma. They said, well, just kill yourself, just, uh, oh, yeah. just drink, just, yeah. you know, whatever, but uh, to destroy you. Uh, demons have all come to kill, steal, and destroy. So you, you carried this with you. Uh, you were like 15 now, and you're drinking and using drugs, and were you dating? Uh, my concept of dating wasn't really <laughs> right. uh, the first boy who like took me on a date um, picked me up it he had a pickup truck and he had like like water bottles filled with tequila and we went to the beach and then I don't remember I don't remember what happened after that wow. I remember I, I eventually made it home but I don't know what happened so you know, um, fill in the blanks there, but I, that was how I was for years. I didn't care, you know, I didn't care how messed up I was. I'd get blackout, um, and I didn't care who did what. I just didn't care. So that drug you mentioned earlier, the, uh, ketamine. ketamine. Yeah. Yeah. Did you, did you try that? Yeah. So that was, um, that became like a drug of choice for me. Um, and I didn't know why at the time, um, but looking back, it was, you know, it was the drug that the traffickers yeah. used on me a lot, and, um, and so, yeah, I, I would do that as often as I could, you know, get my hands on it, um, and that, I would mix that with cocaine, and that's real bad, you know, one's up, one's down, so that's, you know, but again, I didn't care if I died, you know, I really, I wanted to, so... Um, well, at some point, you, you were actually raped. Uh, yeah. What, what, what age was that? Um, so the last time that I um, was raped was I went to college, um, and I was only there for a couple of months because this um, particular situation, uh, and... Um, what what it was is yeah a friend this guy wanted to date me and I didn't want to date him but he had an apartment and you know the rest of us were in the dorms and so you know he'd asked me out a couple times I said no and then um, a girl from the dorms was like well we're gonna go over there and you know party and I was like oh, okay party you know drugs and alcohol it's all I'm all for it so um, so we went over and it was just him there and, um, you know, he drugged me and raped me. And I remember waking up during that, um, and, but paralyzed, you know, couldn't, um, do anything. And so after that, I, I ended up going into, I think that was my first time going to like a mental hospital was after that. Well, what, what kind of drug it wasn't the same thing, was it? No, I think it was this, it's called GHB, I believe is what it is. Um, and it's like a colorless, odorless, like, oh, liquid you would, that they you could, know. yeah, you didn't know until, like, I went to stand up and I knew that I had been drugged. Um, and then I just remember being dragged into the bedroom. Um, what, did, did you report that? No, no. But um, what what I kind of 
realized in hindsight was that it was it sounds crazy, but I really think God was protecting me in that because shortly before that, uh, a friend um, had reached out to me and he said, hey, do you want to start an escort service? And I was like, sure, why not? Right. You know, like, what, what do I care? I was so messed up. I didn't care. I thought that, you know, he's like, you'll go on dates. And we had this friend who was really big you know, guys, like, he'll go with you, you know, everything will be fine, and I was all sort of, like, getting ready to do this, you know, really dangerous thing, and I just think God was like, no, nah, not gonna happen, you know, and I got, I had a really traumatic, you know, that rape, and then in the mental hospital, and then I was I dropped out of college, and that was the end of that, so. so. What, what was the mental hospital? Did you check yourself in, or what? How did that happen? So, um, I, no, I made it back to the dorm the next day, um, and then I basically just l laid there in bed for days, and one of my roommates um, was concerned and ended up getting in touch with my mother, and my mom came to pick me up, and she brought me um, to that hospital but they but I never told them that I was raped like nobody knew about the rape they just yeah. it was just I you know because I had had you know mental problems all along you know I'd been on medication since I was maybe 14 um on and off different well, medications and no mm, wonder yeah yeah uh, so you you were college age what 20 21 or something like that? I, think I was 20 then, yeah. So w what happened after that? Did you want to find a boyfriend and get married? Or? <laughs> no, oh. no. I um, I think I had a, a period of being at home and just kind of lo like a lost person. Um, and eventually I um, took... Eventually, I took a job, I think when I was 25, um, away from home, and um, that actually is a whole another story, but um, it, it was, I moved out of my mom's house and was still drinking, but like a lot less, you know, I was trying to be a responsible drinker, and... Um, <laughs> You know, I had a job, yeah. and uh, um, and that's and I got pregnant, um, and that changed everything for me. Um, I stopped drinking and partying, and um, eventually uh, married um, my children's father, and that was just a toxic marriage. Um, we were two people who didn't. Um, didn't know how to take care of ourselves, let alone, like, have a family. We didn't have faith at that point. I didn't, you know, um, it's like I, I think I, I don't know, kind of just forgot about God because I had felt for a long time he forgot about me. That you, yeah, you know? forsaken. Yeah, I thought, well, you didn't help me in, you know. Yeah. So I was mad at God for a long time. Um, and so we were married for four years. We had three kids, um, and then we divorced, but the divorce took two years. That was, it was all very toxic and, um, and just not, not good. But that, that their father is still part of their life. Yeah. Right? Yeah. He's a good dad. He, um, he has them three days a week and they love their daddy and um yeah he's you know and we get along well enough well, that's, now that's so good. it is good it's good um but I really did hate men and <laughs> I remember I prayed I said you know I didn't because I just didn't know what my life was supposed to be you know um I knew I had three kids to take care of and um I knew that I could only be half of the example for them. And so I, I prayed to God. I said, um, 
you know, God, send me a man who's so good that I know he's from you. Really? And, um, and then, like, two and a half weeks later, I met Eli, and, um, huh. yeah, and Eli is so good. He's, God sent me a good man. Well, he, he is a good man. Uh, I was joking about him earlier, uh, but it, it, it takes a good man to, to know what you've been through and say her story needs to be told. Mm. Uh, I think, I, because I, since, since we've talked, and since I first read your form, by the way, the, the way our del deliverance ministry works, if somebody wants to come for deliverance, there's a request form that they submit, basically telling their story and where the, what their, their needs for deliverance are. And when I read Emily's form, I think I may have contacted you real soon. Yeah. But basically said, you can come anytime you want to. I'll stop what I'm doing to Thank see you. Don. you. <laughs> well, when I read that, it was like, it was, it was like tears. And uh, I, still, I still feel that way when, when I hear you talk about it. But Eli, uh, not many husbands would want their wife to, to share that. And uh, it's, a, it's a blessing that he's interested in ministry and in your life. You mentioned something, uh, and I don't know where, where this was mentioned, but Vancouver? Yeah. Well, you talking about Washington? Um, so I went to... Um, much to my poor mother, because she's just, <laughs> uh, she just, she loved me through all of it. You know, I really wouldn't be here today without right. her love and support. Um, but at one point, um, this band was getting back together, and uh, I had to go to the concert, because they had been, you know, they broke up like eight years before, and uh and so I went to California to see this band, and I got into a fight with the friend that I went with. And so I was, like, out there at this big festival by myself, and I met this guy, and, you know, he's like, come stay with me in, in um, uh, yeah, Vancouver, British Columbia. And I was like, sure, you know. So um, I ended up, <laughs> why not? Why not? Why not? He had... Um, he had a huge house that he rented the rooms out like by the month and it was just a big party house. He had um he had like just a suitcase full of drugs and was like come party and so I did. And um it I remember it was just really gross. We part all kinds of partying and um I remember leaving um the you know situation one it was morning by that point point it was and I went outside and I just prayed I said God this is awful like I knew it was just so wrong everything that we were doing there and I said God get me out of here and um and then the next day um I was able to get a plane ticket and my and I flew to my aunts in Seattle Washington and they picked me up and it was like and you know I hung out there for a little while and then I That's was able your, to your mother's sister um no she had been married to my mother's brother who, okay. who passed yeah so but God got me out of there you know like really fast I, this was a bad situation and God got me out of there and um and but that still wasn't enough for me to like you know straighten my life out it took it took getting pregnant with my daughter before I really you know um changed I know her name. Yeah. Uh, go ahead and say her name. Juliana. Yeah. Juliana. Uh, in case she's watching. Hi, Juliana. <laughs> uh, well, you, you're a, a, a beautiful lady today. And, uh, Thank you. But, you know, it could have been so different. You, you, you could have wound up in prison. Uh, and I see so many inmates. I'm just going to tell a story. I think I shared it with you yesterday. But uh, I would go to uh, a women's prison. 
every other month on a Saturday night down by Waco, Texas. It's uh, called, it's Marlin is the name of the town. But it, at the time, it was the largest women's prison in the world. It, it's not now. But um, I, I would go just for an evangelistic service. The ladies met, their church met in the gymnasium. and uh, So I would go just preach and have an altar call. And people would get saved, you know. But I was, and I had been doing deliverance a little while. So occasionally I would mention demons in the message. And uh, so one night I'm down there and uh, in the prison, when they say church is over, church is over. You know, you don't have to say, well, I need five more minutes. But we had finished this night. The officers came in and said, okay, ladies, do sit up, back to your dorms. And there were chairs moving all over the gym. And But the chaplain came up to me and he said, uh, there's eight ladies here that want you to take them through deliverance. And I said, oh, this, this is not a good setting, all this noise. And uh, he, he said, no, no, you can come during the week and use my office and uh, I'll call them out one at a time. I said, well, that's okay, well, that, that'll work. So his office is a typical office and I get there, the chairs are set up, one across from me and uh, the ladies were seated out in the hallway. So he calls them in one at a time, all wearing white uniforms, kind of all look alike when, you, when you've been there. But uh, this one lady came in and she said, I've never told anybody what I'm about to tell you. I said, not my best friend, not my pastor, not my counselor, nobody. But she said, I know this is a demon. So I'm just listening. And she said, uh, sometimes at night, almost every night, I sense the presence of a man by my bed, uh, the out outline of a man, like a mist figure. I can't, I can't see the face or make out a facial image. But she said, I don't care what anybody says, that thing holds me down and has sex with me. Well, I'd never heard that before. Uh, since I've heard it thousands of times. So I call my friend, uh, who is now deceased, but uh, most of you will know who he is, Frank Hammond, who wrote Pigs in the Parlor. And he had been in deliverance ministry like 40 years at the time. So I called Frank and told him, I said, I ran into something today I've never encountered. And he just kind of chuckled. He said, oh, you've met the incubus spirit. He said, you will run into that with almost every woman you meet. Well, I, I didn't know, but I have including you, just a little anything to open a door, and he becomes a frequent visitor. Uh, he and many of his uh, minions, uh, lust, sexual abuse, sexual rape, is behind a lot of that stuff. So, I actually have encountered that spirit many, many times. And if you're a woman watching this and you've experienced it, that doesn't make you unusual. It makes you normal. Demons work in that area all the time. And uh, I, I, I just want to say that to you. If you need deliverance in that area, just come and do it. Uh, it's torment, and it's a trap. It makes you feel guilty, makes you feel shame. What's wrong with me? Why am I thinking like this? And uh, generally leads to masturbation. And then the person is like, "How can I think these thoughts? Where does that come from? And 
Well, it comes from demons, and uh, and it's very real. So, if you if you have a need in the area of deliverance, uh, it, it can be trauma, like like she experienced. Everybody has a measure of trauma in their life, but many times trauma is a doorway for demons. And uh, just want you to know, I, I, I really appreciate you being who you are. Uh, Emily and sharing with us today and Eli if he's still around uh, appreciate you uh, Tommy and Latrice for uh, hosting us and being a good video producer uh, so so thanks and if you if you want to contact us please do uh, we'll, we'll get back in touch with you